Welcome back after the break. So before we went for our break, we looked at uh, positioning ourselves, you know, in the right place so that we can be protected by God. Okay, and we saw that we need to be in a secret place uh, so that we can receive God's protection. The next one is we need to position ourselves to be promoted. Okay, so we need to grow up in the things of God. For us to grow up in the things of God, we need to grow in the things of life. We need to position ourselves right. So to grow in the things of God, to grow in the things of uh, life, we need to position ourselves rightly. Okay, so if you want to grow in the things of God, if you want to grow up in the things of um, life, how to live your life, you need to position yourself. A good example we can see here is of uh, King David, okay, uh, in Samuel uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Is it 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel? 1 Samuel, okay. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. 2 Samuel, what's there in your notes? 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Thank you. Okay. So before this incident here, we what we read in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, uh, we see that, you know, uh, King David is running away for, you know, to save his life. He's running away from who? King Saul. Yeah. He's running away from King Saul to save his life. And he's like a, you know, he's um, running from place to place. And he's living basically in the caves, in the wilderness. Okay, and then when King Saul dies, um, you know, uh, David inquires of God and says, shall I go up and take any of the cities of Judah? Okay, because God, he knows God has already appointed him, him as the next king. Now King Saul is dead, so he's going to be the next king. So what does David do? You know, uh, we don't see him jumping and say, okay, God has already anointed me as king. I will just go and become king. Okay, but he asked God, you know, this is what we mean by positioning ourselves, uh, you know, um, uh, to be protected. Okay, it is intimacy with God, constantly asking God every stage of your life. Okay, he inquires of God, shall I go up and take any of the cities of Judah? And God tells him, what does he tell him? Go up. Please look at your uh, notes, Second Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Okay, what does God say? Go ahead, go up. Um, and David tells him, where shall I go? Okay, and he says to Hebron. So, you know, he's just talking to God like he's talking to a friend and he wants every detail. And God tells him to go to um, Hebron. And then he goes to Hebron and uh, they make him king over Judah. And then much later, they make him king over uh, Israel. Okay, but what if David would have said, you know, God, you know, I don't want to uh, go and become king. I want to just stay here in the caves. It's nice living in the wilderness, um, like a jungle book, you know, the jungle book story, you know, like jungle books, just staying in the in the wilderness, in the forest, jumping from tree to tree, enjoying the, the sun. No, uh, and I have 400 men who are there, strong men who are there to guard me and protect me. Uh, I'm happy here, God. I don't want to go back to the city. I don't want to become, you know, I don't want to go back. I mean, I'm happy here. Then what What would have happened if he, uh, David would have said that? What would have happened? Yes, Rin? He would never have become a king, yes. What else? Very good. He would have lost out on God's plan and purpose for his life. Okay. Perhaps he would never have been king as well. Okay. And he would have just continued living in that caves. Uh, so here we need to learn an important lesson that if we want promotion, that means if you want to move into the next step or the next move that God has for our life, the next season he has for our life, we need to position ourselves in the right place at the right time so that his plan can be, uh, you know, fulfilled in and through our life. So it was a, for a season that 
David had to live in the caves. So not for his entire life that he was to live in the caves, but there was a season when he had to move from the caves back to the city and live in a palace and be the king of um, uh, Israel and Judah and fulfill his responsibilities. The next one is to position ourselves to be in the current move of God. Okay. Now we know that God has not stopped working. Does God work even today? Yes. Does he, is he continuing to fulfill his master plan? You know what is his master plan? What is his master plan? That all must be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So is he still working? Yes, he's unfolding his plan here on earth. It's not over 2,000 years back when Jesus came and died on the cross, uh, which means that God is executing, his unfolding his plan here on earth. But some of us, we get stuck in the previous plan or the work of God and we miss out on what he is doing currently or what is his current move on the earth now because we are just living in the past. It can be sometimes even the past glory. No, I received uh, uh, salvation, I'm born again, I'm water baptized, I'm all, uh, you know, Holy Spirit baptized. We're just living there in the past. We don't want to move ahead in the current move of God. So why do we miss out on the current move of God? Because we're so fixed on what God did uh, some years back, some months back in our life. And, uh, you know, we need to know, yes, God worked that way at that point in our life. Um, but, you know, it's time to move on because God moves on. Okay. And we need to move on and uh, we need to know what God is doing right now. And that is where we should be. Okay, a good example was the um, uh, the God's general what we had looked at. Okay, uh, William Braham, you know, it was a move of God in that season for healing. Okay, and God used him mightily in that season for healing. But when the the season for healing, miracles, and deliverance, uh, healing uh, came to an end. When that rain of, you know, the outpouring or the rain of that season ended, then he needed to ask God, like David asked God, what do I do next? But he didn't ask God. He quickly jumped and did what he wanted. And he was you know, uh, such a disaster. And he brought about such a lot of wrong teachings and uh, doctrines. Okay, so we need to understand what is God doing right now. And we need to be there, position ourselves and flow in what God is doing uh, right now in our lives or even in the church that we are in or the city or the move of God in our city in, uh, in, or in the nations, we need to recognize it. Okay. Um, we definitely, you know, we need all that God has done in the past, but we need to move on because all that he's done in the past, that's past, that is history. Okay. That's our foundation. But we need to know what God is doing right now and we need to be there at the right time, the right place, in the right move of God so that we can experience his move and fulfill God's plan and purpose in that specific move of God. Okay. Uh, for example, let me give you an example from uh, Numbers chapter 21 verses 5 to 9. Is there in your notes. Uh, the brazen serpent. All of you know about that serpent. You know, the Israelites, they sinned against God. And God sent uh, snakes, venomous snakes, and it bit everybody. And, you know, all the people were dying. And Moses cried out to God. And God tells him, make a bronze snake, put it on top of a pole. Okay, so everybody who sees that, who are bitten and who sees it, they will be healed and they will be uh, saved. Okay, but um, that was a move of God for that particular instance. But what happened? If you look at 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, you know, uh, the same bronze serpent that Moses had made, it became a, uh, you know, a high place. It became a place where they went and started worshipping it instead of worshipping God. You know, what a sad thing. So several years later, we see what happens uh, to something that God used as an instrument for his move or to bring about his move in that season, it became an idol that people started worshipping. Okay. And they got so locked in with what God had done in the past. You know, they did not move on. Uh, they did not look at God. They started looking at the serpent as the one who has saved them, but they failed to look at God as their deliverer, as their healer. <coughs> Sorry. As a deliverer, as a healer. And you know, worship him. 
so um, they got so locked up with the way God was doing things in a certain way, but God had ceased that. It means he stopped doing it, you know, and he's moved on. Uh, and the people got just locked on to the past move of uh, God. And that became a high idol that became an hindrance for them. Uh, and they start instead of worshiping God, they started worshiping that bronze uh, serpent. Okay. Now let's look at Moses. Another example about Moses. You know, uh, Moses. You know, uh, the people set out on their journey in the wilderness uh, and uh, there was no water for the people to drink. So they complained to Moses and God tells, uh, you know, God tells Moses, take your staff, your rod, your stick, you know, and strike the, what? Rock, strike the rock and there will be water that comes out. So we read about this in Exodus chapter 17, verse 1 to 6, where Moses then takes the rod and he goes and he strikes the rock and water comes out and all the people uh, and the animals um, have, you know, their fill. But in Numbers 20, we see a similar incident. Okay, Numbers chapter 20, verses 6 to 12 is there in your notes. Um, we see that, you know, again, there was no water. And this time the people again grumbled. And Moses tells God. And what does God tell Moses? Speak to the rock. He doesn't say strike the rock, but he says, speak to the rock. And Moses is so angry with the people. What does he go and do? Instead of speaking, he strikes the rock in anger twice. And what is the result of that? Did the water come out? Yes, God was faithful in bringing out the water for his people. But what happened to Moses? Yes, you know, God told him, you cannot see the promised land. You will not enter the promised land. Imagine we can say, I mean, just for one small thing, he just struck it and he didn't speak. For that, he was not able to enter the promised land. It's, you know, when we're saying that when, you know, greater the level of position, greater the responsibility, greater the anointing, but we can also say greater the position, greater the anointing, greater the accountability. See, you're greater the accountability. And God will not, you know, deal with it very, very lightly because you've tasted God's goodness, you've seen his power, his anointing, and then, you know, you still go ahead and sin then there is no forgiveness. And uh, did Moses try to tell God if he can enter the promised land? He does, you know, go stands on the mountain and he tells, what does God tell him? He says, don't let, let's not discuss about this. I mean, I'm not just saying it's not uh, exactly the same words, but you know, let's not talk about this. You know, God, that's what God says. And he's not allowed to enter the promised land. So you see how important, uh, you know, it is for us to position ourselves. And why did Moses make this mistake? Because he was still in the past move of God. Past move was strike the rock. This time it was God moved on. Okay. He said, speak to the rock. And he did not do what God um, wanted to uh, do. And he failed. Okay. Yes, God had done things differently in the past, but he's told him what to do this time and uh, he failed. Um, and we see because he failed, you know, um, did God not provide the water? He provided the water for him, um, but he lost out on being part of God's plan and purpose for his life. So see the consequences that it has. Okay. So we need to be in step with what God wants to do in our life. Each step we need to know whether we're in the right time, the right place, doing the right things. Another example is John's disciples. Uh, John's disciples, we read about this in John chapter 1 verses 36 and 37. Okay. John chapter 1, verses 36 and 37 says that, um, you know, um, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. And two of the disciples heard him speak. And what did they do? They followed Jesus. See? 
because John the, they knew John the Baptist was only showing them the way. He was telling them that the true Messiah is going to come. Okay, when he sees the Messiah, he says, you know, behold the Lamb of God. The revelation was given to him and he speaks it. Um, uh, and what do these disciples do? They're very smart. See, they are now changing their move to moving behind Jesus. They're not saying, hey, we are uh, John's disciples. We'll continue being Baptists, you know, because we're John the Baptist's disciples. We will continue being Baptists. No. They say, now we need to take that move. We need to change. They, and they start following Jesus as his uh, disciples. What if they continue to say, okay, we don't want Jesus. We don't know if he's the Messiah. You know, John the Baptist was our uh, guru, you know, our leader. We'll just follow him. Okay, what would have happened? They would have missed out on the move of God. They would have missed out on the plan of God for their life. They would have missed out on, uh, you know, what God would want to entrust them. or uh, They would have missed out on them experiencing, you know, firsthand their relationship with Jesus, the uh, Messiah. Okay. So we need to position ourselves right, okay, to receive, to fulfill God's plan and purpose for our lives, to receive God's provision for our life, to receive God's protection and uh, to receive a promotion from God and also to be in the current move of God. Okay. Any questions so far? Are you able to understand about what is positioning yourself? Yes. Hope you're able to understand. Okay. What are the things to keep in mind as you position yourself? Be willing to let go. Okay, don't hold on to things very, very tightly. Don't get caught up to things very tightly. There are few things that you need to hold on to tightly. There are the rest of the things you have to hold on to them very lightly. Okay, did you get that? There are few things in life that you have to hold on to very tightly. And there are and many things in life that you have to hold on to or let go. There are few things in life you have to hold on very lightly. Okay, so any moment it's very light, it can just fall, you can just let it go. So one of the things that you hold on to tightly is your relationship with God and what else? What do you hold on to tightly in life? Okay, that's your relationship with God, word of God. Second thing is? Okay, that all comes when you hold on to God. Your, basically your relationship with your family your parents if you're married your spouse your children okay so family wife and children so these two things you hold on to tightly the first thing is your relationship with god the second thing is your relationship with your family your wife your children you know sometimes we are holding on to some things of the past you know that we're not willing to let go uh, and that's why we are not able to receive God's plan and purpose for our lives. We're not uh, able to receive uh, what God is releasing in and through our lives, the move of God he wants to release in and through our lives. Uh, but if you want to receive, you have to let go. Okay, You have to just give up some things. You know, sometimes we can hold on to our present. We can say, God, you know, I'm comfortable here in this place, in this job. Uh, uh, in my hometown, you know, why do you want to move me? Uh, sometimes we are so caught up in our past, you know, the looking at the past days, or um, we're so caught up in some certain relationships that, you know, we are emotional, we have emotional ties. Um, uh, and you're holding on to these things so tightly, you're not willing to let go. You just can't let go. Okay. Some of them are not a positive influence on you they're not helping you but you're just holding on to all the past bitterness hatred sometimes all the past things that happen in your life but if you want to position yourself at the right time the right place you need to let go an example is lot's wife you know lot's wife you know what did the uh, what did god say run and don't look back but she was so caught up with the town and the people in the town that she turned back to see the destruction and she became a pillar of uh, salt, okay? The second thing we need, to, we can do uh, or to keep in mind as you position yourself is to be willing to step out into the unknown, okay? 
sometimes when God, uh, you know, is asking us to do certain things, uh, it is like stepping out into the unknown. For most of you coming here to Bible College in Bangalore City was stepping out in the unknown. What it is going to be like, what the food going to be like, what the hostel going to be like, what things going to be like. Okay. Um, God is not going to necessarily tell us everything. Okay. Like Abraham, a great example. Okay. And Abraham, he said, leave your father's household and go to the place that I am going to show you. Okay. All of you with me? Yes. Okay, what if Abraham had said, God, why should I go to an unknown place? You know, uh, you know, why are you moving me out to an unknown place? I mean, I'm more comfortable here. Can't you make me a father of many nations here itself? I'm also here with all my um, uh, relatives, you know, um, and uh, my father is here, mother is there, uncles, aunts. You know, cousins, everybody is here. You know, can't you fulfill your purpose in and through me uh, here where I am? Why do you want me to want? Why do you want uh, to move me? Okay. But we see that Abraham obeyed God. He went. Okay. And when he positioned himself in the right place at the right time, he could experience God's promotion. He could experience God's protection uh, and experience God's uh, providence as well. Okay. Um, be careful how you enter and leave. Okay, so every season there will be a place where you enter, there will be a place where you leave. Okay, so for example, you finish your study here in Bible College, you know, um, or you know, I'm moving out from uh, a job, from one job to another job. So you're saying, you know, oh, I got a better job, I'll just wait for the last day to come. The last day, you know, all of these people really troubled me. I'll just give them all a good piece of my mind. And, uh, you know, I'll leave because anyway, I don't have anything to do with them. And I'll tell them what a good job I got in uh, somewhere abroad and how much I'm going to earn. I'll just teach them all a lesson. Okay. Now we can. Do That's not how we God wants us to leave. Because how we leave determines how we enter into the next season of our life because we're leaving here with hatred bitterness uh, with uh, uh, with uh, you know um, anger and when we are entering into the next season the next place that god has for us we will enter with the same attitude we'll enter with the same mindset okay let me be be careful of this 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 is person this is what happened in the past this is what they did i need to do like this i need to do like that you know uh, so you know you're entering with the same mindset so if you leave, exit the previous place, you know, uh, just being nice, being loving, being forgiving, uh, being compassionate, gracious, knowing that maybe you have been wrong, but God is a faithful judge. He will judge. When you enter into the next place, you will receive God's favor. You will enter with the right attitude and, you know, things will work perfectly fine for uh, you. Okay, so be careful how you enter and uh, leave. Uh, because the way you enter determines how you will, uh, sorry, the way you exit will end, uh, or leave will determine how you enter into the next season of your life. Be open to change, okay? Uh, we all know that change is very difficult. All of you are in the process of change now uh, from home to, uh, to hostel life and like, study. Some of you have not studied for a long time and you've not gone through this rigorous uh, study system, especially those of you from North India, you know. Um, but, you know, change is difficult, but, uh, you know, adapt to the change and learn so that it will just help you because God has brought you here and say, God, I'm just going through all of this so that, you know, I'm positioning myself right so that I can, you can build me up to do something significant uh, and great for your kingdom so that I can be uh, of significance for the kingdom of God. Okay. So be able to accommodate change when you are repositioning your um, self. Because, you know, whenever there's a change, things are going to be different. Then you, uh, you know, before you make a move, prepare for it. Now, what next, God? Okay, ask God now itself. God, what next? Where do you want me to go? Show me what you want me to do and start preparing me from right now. Okay, 
um, I, I know some people in Bible college, you know, especially those who come from, uh, you know, uh, Nepal and the Northeast and all that. Um, uh, during summer holidays, we have about two or three months summer holidays, and they they stay on campus. They don't go back home because it's a long journey and summer is hot, and all that. And so you know, um, they and I asked them, how do you spend your summer holidays? It was boring. They said no, it was actually more hectic and busy than when we had Bible college when it was running. I said, what did you do? They said, you know, we prepared sermons. And I was like, really shocked. They said, prepared sermons. They said, you know, when we go back to our home places, we won't have all of these books, these dictionaries. Uh, we won't even have the time to prepare messages. And so we are preparing the messages now so that we can go and, you know, we'll have all of this so that we can. I was like, wow, you know, how wonderful just to think. Well, just then what meets the eye, they were able to see beyond and prepare themselves for what God is calling them to um, do, okay? So we need to prepare ourselves for the next move of God. Um, God would at all times use the actions of others to also position us. You know, sometimes we can get lazy. Sometimes we have some nasty attitudes, some dirty attitudes, some weaknesses. Uh, and God uses people to correct us. Okay. Uh, but when he uses people to correct us, we shouldn't be upset with them. Uh, they are just put there by God so that we can position ourselves right and get on with God's plan uh, for our life. So God is using them to get, get you on to fulfill your plan and purpose for your life. Okay. For example, uh, we know Joseph's story, right? Uh, Potiphar, his, his, his brothers, you know, um, treated him as slaves and his Potiphar and, and he was thrown into the prison but we see his his attitude okay he never grumbled murmured he just did what was required and God lifted in a, promoted him and you know gave him a position of great promo, uh, position of greater promotion and honor because God saw his attitude and his faithfulness okay be strategic don't wander aimlessly uh, when you look at your life, look at everything is connected to God's plan and purpose for your life, okay? Right from where you are studying, okay? What you're studying, what you're going through, what God is preparing you, look at all of it as something that God is using, you positioning you strategically uh, to build you, uh, to work in you so that you can do something of greater significance which he has to build the kingdom of God, okay? And the last thing that will answer Jaitan's uh, question, God is greater than your mistakes. He can reposition you to do his will, okay? We know that Moses made mistake. We know that, um, uh, uh, you know, David also did a mistake. But when we make mistakes, you know, God is greater than our mistakes. He can reposition us. But uh, we need to be willing to change we need to identify our mistakes we need to ask god to forgive us and when we go back in repentance god will put us back on the track um, and uh, if you are open to god and say god i want to position myself in the right place at the right time doing what you want me to do then god will help us and it's extremely important for us uh, you know to follow through with god and to be in the right place at the right time like for example moses and Jonah, remember Jonah? You know, it's like Jonah was like uh, like that potato put back into the pressure cooker, right? And then finally he he goes to um, Nineveh. Okay, so we need to repent, our sins, and we come back. God is willing to reposition us and put us on track and fulfill His plan and purpose for our lives. Any questions? Any questions from our online students? Okay. Any of you have any questions? No. Yes, Sean.
Yeah, true. So Sean is just adding on to the last point. He was saying that, um, you know, David is a good example because uh, David uh, committed many faults, but every time he did, he goes back to God. And when he goes back to God and asks for forgiveness, he just basically learns more of God's way of doing things. And uh, his intimacy with God grows more closer. His trust and dependence with God most grows more closer. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a good uh, question. So um, what this uh, a student here is saying is that, uh, you know, when um, when um, you know when we do a mistake you know and um, you know it yes it delays god's purpose for our life but like he's he's pointing out and what i said he says but it does not take away god's purpose uh, from their life it just delays then what about uh, king saul when king saul disobeyed you know uh, you know he um, uh, God removed him as a uh, king, okay, saw him no longer as king, uh, which is a good example. But, you know, um, in Saul's case, uh, God showed him his mistake, but yet he was not willing to repent. You know, when Nathan goes and says, what is all the sheep that are bleating? And, you know, uh, he says, you know, we brought back some things just to you know, and why did you kill the? Why did you not kill the king? You're supposed to kill everybody, not bring back all of the animals. And then he's uh, he tries to cover up his mistake and say, you know, come with me, like as if to say, you're my friend. Come with me because we are going to sacrifice uh, in front of the people. So in front of the people, he wanted to show that okay. God is not angry, Nathan is not angry with him. What he's done is the right thing. But what if he had repented, like King Hezekiah, you know? Uh, king Hezekiah repented and uh, God gave him 15 more years to live. What about King Ahab? You know, when King Ahab, when he took uh, neighbors, uh, Naboth's vineyard, um, you know, um, and God sends the prophet Elijah and says, because you've done this wicked thing, you know, uh, all of your, uh, you know, descendants will die and their blood will sun and the dogs of the field will eat and uh, the birds of the air will also, you know, eat the flesh and all that. And then what does uh, Ahab do? You know, he repents. He goes to God and repents. And then what does God tell when Nathan comes back? God tells Nathan, look at how Nahab is, you know, repenting. Okay. And because he repented, God says, I will remove that. Uh, it will not happen during his lifetime, but it will happen to his uh, generations. So, you know, there is, uh, God is a gracious, compassionate and merciful God. That is another side of him. And there's another side where, you know, he, he does punish him, but... You know, if they uh, ask for forgiveness, son, and you can you can say, okay, then why not for Moses? You know, uh, sometimes we really don't know God's ways. It may be also because um, uh, he wanted to teach the people of Israel, you know, obedience, son, and as a leader, it was due diligence from him to be obedient. Okay, good question. Very nice. Yes, Sean. Samuel. Yes. Yes. Uh, so Sean is saying, uh, just like Saul covered up his mistake when Prophet Samuel came, uh, uh, if Adam and Eve could have also confessed their uh, sin rather than blaming each other and hiding away from God. Good thoughts. Good. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Yes, pillar of salt. Yes. That's what the Bible says. Okay, so he's saying uh, the Lord's wife, the question one of our students asked was, was Lord's wife really like a pillar of salt? And he said, yes. <laughs> yeah. Any questions from our um, online students? All of you with me? Online students? Okay, if there are no questions, then we will move on to the prize of the high calling of God, which is the next chapter. Okay. You know, in life, it's very exciting if you're living for something that is higher and bigger than ourselves. Yes or no? Now, when you have something, a purpose that is higher and bigger than yourself, life becomes really exciting. Okay. Uh, so what is this? You know, what is uh, the higher and the bigger uh, you know, calling or the purpose that brings excitement in their life, it is to live our heavenly call, um, live for heavenly purpose. Okay. So as we give our life to God and say, God, you know, you work in my life, God beautifully unfolds his plans in our lives. Okay. He takes us through life. He begins to open uh, things up in our life. He, um, uh, you know, removes circumstances that are not right. He order circumstances that uh, that will right he changes circumstances for us and he helps us he brings people the right contacts he brings into our life and he moves us forward in what he has for our uh, life so this is it is actually very exciting to live for god and it's also exciting to know that god has a plan and purpose for everyone which is unfolding which he reveals he lets us know so, you know, life has tremendous meaning when we lock into God's plan and purpose for our life. It's become very exciting. It becomes uh, fun. It becomes uh, worth, life becomes worth living. Okay. But there's another side to it. You know, when we are in the process of fulfilling God's purpose for our life, it will cost each one of us something. Okay. It will cost each one of us something yes it's exciting it's the best life to live when we're living in god's plan and purpose for our life but it's not going to be easy okay now some of us don't want suffering we think suffering is not for me it's for my neighbor it's for somebody else and we also don't like this word sacrifice right you don't like these two words which begin with s suffering and sacrifice but if you want to do what God wants us to do, then uh, and we want to fulfill God's plan and purpose for our life, then we need to come to a place where we're, we're willing to sacrifice, and we will also go through suffering, but we'll have to endure, just like we read, you know, we have to run our race with perseverance, enduring, enduring all the tribulations, all the difficulties. Look at uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Can somebody read that, please? Read, read. Yes. So what does it say here? Jesus is saying, if you cannot carry your cross, or you cannot bear your cross, then you cannot be my disciple. Okay? So if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, or if you follow him, then there'll be one thing that will be part of your life. And what is that? You have to take up your cross when? Daily. Okay, which means you have to carry your cross daily. Okay. Uh, we look at three things uh, the cross signifies. The cross signifies it's a place of suffering. And when we look at the cross, we see how much Jesus suffered for us, the pain, the agony, uh, the shame. He was even forsaken by his father. Okay, it was not easy for him, and it's not going to be easy for us to carry our cross daily and follow him. Cross is also a place of separation. Okay, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So, what is Paul saying here? So Paul is saying, you know, after I accepted Jesus as my personal savior, after I had this encounter with God, or um, 
you know, in the language that I need to put it in what we are talking now, after the entrance of the cross in his life, you know, he says he separated from the world. Okay. Um, you know, and he says that, uh, you know, um, whatever I boast, I boast except, I'll not boast of the things that I have. Okay. But I will boast about the cross. He could have boasted a lot about things about himself. He was uh, a scholar. He studied under uh, Gamaliel, uh, the well-trained um, scholar, teacher in those times. Um, he also was a leader. Um, Saul was a leader before he became Paul. Uh, but he says he will boast in the cross okay and when he's writing galatians he's also you know uh, founded many churches um, he's written many epistles but he says he will boast about nothing excepting the cross so the entrance of the cross in our life you know separates us from the world we are in the world okay we all belong to this world okay uh, we are living in this world but we belong to the kingdom of God, sorry. Okay, we live in this world, but we belong to the kingdom of God. We belong to the kingdom of heaven. Okay, we. So, what what do we mean by this? We are living in this world, but the world is crucified to us, which means the world is dead to each one of us. Okay, it means that the world does not attract us any more. Any of the things of this world does not attract us. Okay. And the uh, cross is also a place of suffering. Now, suffering means uh, you know two things. We can uh, we can think about suffering here. The first thing is giving up, you know, rights or giving up something that you have a right to. I'll explain. Okay, so, so sacrifice here could mean two things. The first thing is giving up something that you have right to. And then take on something that you don't have to. Okay. The first one is giving up something that you have right to. And the second one is you take on something that you don't um, have to. Okay. So um, I'll just give you an example. Uh, giving up something that you have a right to. Um, you know, sometimes... Um, you know, some way of living, some, you know, some people don't like certain food. And we think like as Christians, we shouldn't, you know, be eating a pork. You know, so, and if it's going to be a hindrance to another believer, then I might as not, you know, Paul says, might as well not eat it because that's not going to edify a believer. Okay. For example, if I go to North India and I have to teach we have short-term Bible colleges in North India, or we are called to preach. We all wear salwar, okay? And there they cover their head. The ladies cover their head, so we have to cover our head. And we also, you know, we uh, in our church here we put footwear and go up on the stage, but there they don't like us putting the footwear on top, okay? So you know, it's my legal right. I can wear je a trouser or jeans. I can wear even. Um, a top which is decent looking and I can go and preach but you know they will not accept me and I'm going to be a hindrance from them to accept the gospel uh, or, or to share with them what God has laid in my heart just because of my attire okay they will they say they will think that okay she's so worldly why should I listen to her you know and as it is she's a lady and she looks so young what does she know about the the gospel about the word of God and why should I listen to her. Now, we've had this kind of attitude when we've gone to North India. So when we when we go there, we basically, you know, we wear salwar, we even cover our head, we put a dupatta on our head, and we don't wear footwear, and, uh, you know, we sit along with them just to identify with them. So it's a legal right to do certain things, but we don't do it, you know, so that others are benefited. And you take on something that you don't have to. Okay, you take on something that you don't have to. For example, you know, um, 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 just say, you know, the church, they are just cleaning up the church. So, you know, on a Saturday, um, all the teens, the youths, the teens, they come to church and they, you know, they do a cleanup. Now, you know, they're not required to do the cleanup. 
uh, you know, they're just teenagers, they could have gone to the mall, they could have gone out with their friends, they could have sat at home and watched the movie. But you know, they did something that they didn't have to, but they did it because they love the Lord, they want to do something for the church. So they all turned up on Saturday morning, and they cleaned up the entire uh, church, or you know, they helped out in some program. Or, uh, you know, like, for example, when we have our sessions, uh, you know, some of them, we don't have childcare, so we need people for childcare. And we have people who step in and help with childcare. Now, they really don't have to do it, but, you know, they, you know, something they don't have to do it, but they're doing it. It's a sacrifice they're making rather than just, you know, they're staying back at home. They get one day of leave Saturday. They can enjoy it with their family. They can go out shopping. They can rest, but they're coming and doing childcare. So that is meaning of a sacrifice. So Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses, uh, verse 7, can somebody read that? Philippians 3, verse 7. Yeah, so Paul is saying, whatever things were gained for me, that means, you know, all my, uh, that I'm a scholar, you know, I'm well trained in the Old Testament, I know all the Old Testament, I, I myself can become a teacher, you know, I'm a learned man. He says, all these things I counted loss for Christ, okay? Because, you know, looking at the cross, that is much more greater to boast about than what I have accomplished or the knowledge I have, the skills I have, the talents I uh, have. Okay. We look at John chapter 12, verses 24 to 26, and then we'll end there. Okay. Can somebody read that? Somebody else can read John chapter 12, 24 to 26. Quickly. Thank you. So here we see that if we live a self-centered life, we will be like that seed that contains itself, okay? Or we will be like people who contain our lives within ourselves and you will just remain alone, okay? But if you're willing to fall to the ground and you're willing to die, then Jesus says, what does he say? You will bear much fruit, okay? So you know what is the pathway to be fruitful? Or what is the path for fruitfulness? The path to fruitfulness is always dying to yourself, is death. Now, all of us want to be fruitful in life, yes or no? The pathway of fruitfulness in our life is always death. So every time we die, we're getting ready for resurrection. Every time we are dying to some things in our life, you know, we are actually resurrecting into a more glorious image of being like Jesus Christ or being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay. So these things are not in your notes. That's why I'm saying, please follow your notes. And if it's not there, you can make a note of it. You can write it down. Okay. So we all want God's resurrection power to be manifest in our life. Yes or no? We're all saying, God, you know, give me the resurrection power. Let the resurrection power just flow through my life. But if the resurrection power needs to flow in and through our life, we must be willing to die to our self. So Jesus said, if you die to self, you will live. So every time we die to ourselves, that means what? When we die to our sinful, lustful uh, natures, you know, habits, attitudes, mindsets, you know, every time we die to ourselves, we are actually bearing fruit. We are bearing fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Every time we make this make a sacrifice of dying to the pleasures of the sinful body, our mind, our thoughts, our emotions, it's actually leading us into grateful, greater fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. Okay, so, so two things. When we die to ourselves, it bears fruit. And what's the second thing? It brings about resurrection. Thank you, Nina. Okay. So we must understand that cross is a place of suffering, it's a place of separation, it's a place of sacrifice, and all of this is part of our journey. Now you might be thinking, okay, you know, um, I want to just fulfill God's plan for my life, but I'm not willing to 
make any sacrifices. I'm not going willing to go through all these sufferings. Um, you know, and I don't think God will give me all of these. Well, we see in, in, the, in the Bible, we read of uh, various people, you know, all of them went through challenges, difficulties, sufferings, and they had to make sacrifices. And that's when they, they were in the right place, in the right time, doing the right thing. And they received God's uh, protection, provision. They were able to fulfill God's purpose for their uh, purpose for their life. And they also received God's promotion. OK, we'll end here. Um, thank you all for joining class. Uh, anyone has any questions, online students? OK, Krisha says, are ladies supposed to cover their heads while praying or worshiping? It's mentioned by Paul in Corinthians. Yet still, some women do not cover their heads. What is the right way? OK, since we are running out of time, uh, can I explain this, uh, give you the answer for this question? Um, uh, next week, Krisha, is that OK? Is that fine? Sorry, we're running out of time. I need to run to my next class. But it's a good question. We'll answer it uh, next class. OK, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being patient and listening. Have a